you know, our program subject is monarch butterflies and trying to maintain a habitat for them here on Kiowa. So I'd like to introduce my special guest, Mr. Billy McCord, who received his undergraduate and master's degrees in wildlife, fisheries, biology at Clemson. And you're our state premier expert. I don't know about all that. On modern butterflies. <laughs> I tell people, look at my face. Do I look like I've got lots of experience? <laughs> yes. So I have actually been studying monarchs for 25 years. This is the 26th year that I have studied the monarch monarchs in coastal South Carolina. So I almost certainly have the Guinness World Record of the number of monarchs tagged by an individual. I've tagged 48,000. Um, wow. 600 and something, no, 406, 48,406 <laughs> monarchs. So nobody else has come anywhere close to that. And I'm going to reach 50,000 tags by the end of this year. I also have another little fun fact that I wanted to ask you about. So the Guinness Book of World Records for consecutively putting and spitting out of your mouth 16 <laughs> carpenter bees and I saw, and then they all flew away they didn't like yeah they all they all try to bite you or right. something so having seen those big fuzzy black and yellow bees you know what I'm talking about can you imagine 16 I use that as an educational it's educational because most people don't realize that only female bees wasps and ants can sting Males are not equipped with the proper organ to sting because the sting organ is a modified ovipositor, oh. a modified egg laying device. So the males obviously don't have that. So if you can positively identify a bee wasp or an ant as a male, it can't harm you. <laughs> so if these were male eastern carpenter bees because the eastern carpenter bee, the male has a yellow patch on its face that the female doesn't have. So it's got a full black face and you stick it in your mouth. It'll set you on fire. <laughs> so I have made the mistake of accidentally grabbing a female with my hand when she had pollen on her face. And I thought it was a male and I got stung. So I know for a fact the females can and will sting. Um, but the males cannot. So for educational purposes, I was out with a bunch of Boy Scouts one day. So I grabbed, caught one in midair actually. You know how they kind of hover? So I like made a real quick swipe and accidentally caught it and put it in my mouth and they were all like, oh my gosh, what is he doing? <laughs> so I it was in there for a, few, for a few seconds and I let a couple of them come up close to me. You could hear it buzzing in my mouth. <laughs> and then I spit it out and it flew off. So it was like, cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna turn this over to Lily and let him get on with his presentation and we'll have some questions, uh, time for questions uh, afterwards. If anyone would like, we've got plenty of bottled water, we've got some snacks. Napkins, mask, hand sanitizer, if you'd like. And I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. I don't know how much time you guys are planning on spending for this. We have an hour okay. to change. Okay, because so. I brought, I've also got five monarch butterflies oh, with great. me that I can tag and show you how I tag them and we can let them go. Yeah. They're actually from Folly Beach, but since they're, they're theoretically heading south now, I'm actually doing them a good deed by moving them to <laughs> yeah, Kiowa. Yeah. And yeah. if they don't want to leave Kiowa, for instance, they, these, these butterflies came from eggs that were found on tropical milkweed plants. That I bet there's a bunch of tropical milkweed plants on Kiowa. So if they want to stay where there's tropical milkweed, they can stay on Kiowa and they'll be just like they, if they were staying on Folly. It won't be any, won't be any big right. deal. But anyway, I can tag those to show you how to go about tagging them. That'd be great. Um, All right, Billy. Take it away. So I... Uh, uh, I was employed by the Department of Natural Resources for about 40 years and uh, retired. And then they hired me back as an hourly employee and my job as an hourly has been working on monarch butterflies. I was on a federal grant working on monarch butterflies uh, and when the COVID situation started. And about the same time, the grant ran out of money. So I was released from employment, but I'm so, Passionate or what's a, what's a step beyond passion? Obsessed. Obsessed. <laughs> I'm so obsessed with monarch butterflies that I continue to do my monarch butterfly research even when I wasn't being paid. So I've put probably 10,000 miles on my automobile riding back and forth to the Francis Mayer National Forest and other places studying monarch butterflies uh, without any salary. But anyway. 
So I told you I've tagged uh, 48,406 monarchs as of today, and that's including the five that I'm going to tag with you guys. I'm counting those already, so they're my total. <laughs> but you can see this: the, the tagging is coordinated by the University of Kansas, a program called Monarch Watch, and it's most of the participants are school teachers, and they do it for educational purposes, so they get their school kids to help them tag the butterflies. Well, it's really interesting because. When you get the directions from the University of Kansas, they, this is the stick-on label that is a tag that has a unique code on each one. Has a, has now they have four letters and three numbers, and each one is different for every butterfly. No other, no monarch will ever wear the same number as any other monarch. So it's basically like giving them a social security number. They have a unique identification, and it's recorded. Being a scientist, I record a whole lot of stuff about these monarchs, a lot more than most people would. But I record, I measure their wing length, I determine the conditions of their wings, whether it's a male or a female, which everybody does that, what it was doing when I caught it, which is really valuable because I get a lot of good information on um, what kind of plants they go to for nectar and things like that. Um, but even to where you apply the tag, the University of Kansas, their, their directions are misleading. <laughs> because this, this vein right here on the wing, that vein right there on the bottom of that tag is raised off the wing surface. So if you put the tag on top of that vein, part of the tag, it's a self-adhesive tag. It's like a self-adhesive label you would buy at Walmart or somewhere, but it's more adhesive than that. The University of Kansas claims they stay on the butterflies forever. But I know that's not true because I've caught monarchs that, I, that had lost their tags because I can see where the scales on the wings were removed by the glue on the tag. But anyway, if you put that, that tag across that vein, part of the surface of the tag is not attached to the wing. So it's more likely to, loop, to lose the tag. Uh, so all these people that do this for the Monarch Watch, people, if they follow the instructions, they're putting a tag in a place where it may not stay on the butterfly. Because uh, if you get all, away from that vein, the wing is very flat. So usually I move the tag up this way a little bit. So this is the, what I've primarily been studying is the migratory monarch population, which most of the monarchs in North America, monarchs are tropical insect. They evolved this migratory behavior because if they didn't, they would die. But they gradually moved up to the northern United States and southern Canada because there's huge population of milkweed. There's a milkweed up in that part of the United States, northern United States and southern Canada called common milkweed that is quite common or was quite common and it's the primary caterpillar food plant for the monarch butterfly population in North America. Um, so most of our monarchs in North America migrated in the fall and they migrated as much as 3,000 miles and everybody learns that they're going to Mexico. Well guess what? The ones that migrate down through our area do not go to Mexico. And in fact, the final destination for many of those is the coast of South Carolina. And I I'm the one that has documented that uh, because of tagging. One poor monarch that I caught at Folly Beach, I tagged it uh, in October and I caught it the last time, the 17th time that I caught it was in March. So I caught it 17 times at Folly Beach between October and March. And I've gotten multiple recoveries of a number of monarchs during the wintertime. So I know they stay here during the winter, and I see good-sized numbers of monarchs in the wintertime. So I've, I have uh, had a monarch tagging project all along the coast of South Carolina um, where I had volunteers, some from Kiowa, uh, tagging monarchs. So anyway, the, ones that, the early part of the migration through our area, a lot of them go down into South Florida where there are non-migratory monarchs. I told you they're tropical insects, so South Florida has local population of the monarchs year-round. So some of the early migrants go all the way down to South Florida and just become absorbed into those non-migratory populations. And that's about to the end of October. Once you get into November, if you see a monarchy at Kiwa, there's a good chance it's going to stay here for the winter. The latest I've tagged a monarch and had it recovered. I've had uh, like six or eight monarchs recovered in Florida. That's how I know they, that a lot of them are going to Florida. And the latest tagging date for one of those butterflies was the 2nd of November. All the others were tagged prior to the 2nd of November. So this just shows you Folly Beach. That's over about 
though 20 years or so, 24 years of tagging, 25 years of tagging. Um, so that just shows you the peak is in late October. So you can pretty much count on it that by late October you're going to have lots and lots of monarchs moving through. And since they're moving generally from northeast to southwest, they tend to accumulate on the southwest end of the Barrier Islands. And the reason is because if, the, if it's windy, they don't like to fly across water because they lose control and they're only blown offshore. So they wait for the wind to subside, so they'll gradually move down the islands and accumulate on the southwest end. So I think Beachwalker Park is probably the ideal place to look for large numbers of monarchs at Kiowa. Because I go to Folly Beach County Park, since it's, I live on James Island, that's where I catch most of my monarchs in the fall. So that shows the recoveries. I've recovered uh, 14 monarchs at Folly Beach that were tagged elsewhere, and as far as 230 to 1,000 miles or more north. So I caught one at Folly Beach that was tagged in Ontario, Canada. And I caught one at Folly Beach that was tagged in upstate Pennsylvania on the western side of the Appalachian Mountains. And at that time, it was the first record of a monarch actually crossing the Appalachian Mountains from one side to the other. So generally, the monarchs that are on the west side of the Appalachians go to Mexico. The monarchs that are on the east side of the Appalachians go to Florida and South Carolina. And actually, there are records of monarchs been, that were tagged on the east coast and having gone to Cuba and some of the Bahamian Islands. So that just shows you the recovery rate. So if you tag monarchs in the central U.S., you get over 1% recovery in Mexico. But if you tag them on the coast anywhere, you see even in Virginia, the tag recovery rate is very low, the coastal part of Virginia, and even in Cape May, New Jersey, which is farther north. So if they go to the coast, they're on the coast in the coastal area, they don't generally do not go to Mexico. In fact, there have been three recoveries reported from Mexico for South Carolina. I tagged one of them, and two of them were tagged by the Charleston County Parks people who were actually tagging for me that year. They were all, that one year, 2001, so I've tagged 25,000 other monarchs along the coast and never had one, none of those have been recovered in Mexico. So we know, because the University of Kansas has found out that the, the the area in Mexico is way out in the middle of nowhere, and it's at 10,000 feet elevation in a cloud forest area where the major industry is logging. So that's one of the problems with the monarchs is they're losing habitat because of, of, of illegal logging in the, the areas where they overwinter. But the people that get rewards for the tags is how we find out that the monarchs go to Mexico as locals go around and if they have like a winter kill from a snow event or something, it stuns the monarchs or kills them they can get the tag numbers and get in touch with the University of Kansas and they get a reward of like six to seven US dollars. Which for those people, that'd be like us getting a thousand dollars. So they have learned, these people are, are out in the middle of nowhere, poor people, but they're not stupid. So they have learned that the tags are in sequences of a thousand tags per prefix. Or, uh, so if it starts with three letters, this, this, it starts with 000 and goes all the way up to 999. So they know if they find one of those tags, there's another 999 with that prefix. So they we have what they call a counterfeit reports of recoveries of cavemen. So I think that's probably what happened back in 2001 because otherwise I can't understand why there haven't been other recoveries reported. So again, I tell you, I get a good number of recoveries in Florida, and I've had one in uh, almost in the, actually in Alabama, just across from the Florida Panhandle. So it's been said, claimed that the monarchs that migrate in the fall go into sexual diapause. In other words, they have no interest in sex or reproduction at all when they're in migratory mode. But I frequently catch monarchs bonded and mating in the fall and at other times. So if they're not going, if they're going to Florida, why would they go into sexual dipoles when they're going to a place where all their other monarchs are not in sexual dipoles? So 
I think that's why that it, why that's the case. So I've uh, I told you I've been doing this for now. This is 26 years, 26 years. So I've called over 5,000 individuals that myself in de from December to March, which is basically what I call winter. My seasons, I divide things by seasons based on the behavior of monarch butterflies. So in winter, they're pretty much stationary. They don't go anywhere. So that's basically from December through the end of March. And that was a uh, pretty phenomenal at Patriots Point in Mount Pleasant. And the butterflies there, as you can see, I recovered 48% of the ones that I tagged. So that's pretty good, because they're not that, if you go out and try to catch monarch butterflies, they're not that easy to catch. So if you recover, if you recapture 48% of them, they must be staying around. So some of the plants that they use in the late in the winter and early spring, some native plants or weeds, like dandelion. People hate dandelion, but monarch butterflies love it. A lot of the monarchs I catch in the winter are nectaring on dandelion flowers. And then the hen bit grows in disturbed like fields and things like that, and south thistle also in disturbed areas mostly. But they're landscaping plants that people use, no doubt at Kiowa, that are very attractive to monarchs. So in late no in November and December, loquat or Japanese fig, um, which is an evergreen tree, it is a fantastic pollinator plant. And hummingbirds and Baltimore Orioles, things like that, love it too. But if you have loquat on Kiowa, you will have monarch butterflies in November and December. When the loquat is flowering, the monarchs will find it. They also use bottle brush and lantana throughout, but anytime it's blooming, you might see a monarch on it. And then in February, viburnum suspensum, which is a plant that's used for hedges and so forth, that is very salt tolerant, so there's a lot of it on the Barrier Islands. It blooms in February when not much of anything else is flowering, and monarchs love it. So I have, well, believe it or not, I'm capable of learning. <laughs> so through all my years of experience, I have learned that in February, I want to go where does Viburnum suspensum and I'll find monarchs. And indeed I do. So I know where all the Viburnum suspensum is on folly. <laughs> so monarchs are, they accumulate the toxins from what the caterpillars eat. So you've heard the phrase, you are what you eat. That's very applicable, particularly to insects. So monarch caterpillars only eat milkweed. And milkweed has chemicals in it that attack the heart system of vertebrates. So vertebrates will not eat monarchs. At the very least, they'll get sick. At the very worst, they'll be killed. So monarchs are orange in color, so it's a, orange is considered a warning color. So animals with color vision will be are wary of any kind of thing that's got red or orange on it. So for instance, we probably would not touch a black widow spider even if we had not been told that they're venomous because they have that bright orange red spot on them that stands out. So the but invertebrates are not affected by the chemicals inside in monarch butterflies. So the caterpillars have the chemicals and then the chemicals are passed on to the adult butterfly as well. But they are eaten by invertebrates. So this is, a, just a week or two ago, this is one of my monarchs, believe it or not, it's one I had tagged in one of these swamps. That's the milkweed that they like in the swamps called aquatic milkweed. So there's a praying mantis. It caught my monarch. And when I got there, it probably had caught it maybe 10 or 15 minutes before I got there because it had only eaten the head of the butterfly. And they start by eating the head. Because they know that if they decapitate, the victim is not going to get away from them. So the first thing they do when they catch another insect is to eat its head. So I, I, I grabbed the praying pray mantis and the butterfly because I wanted to check and see if it might have one of my tags on and indeed it did. It was one I had tagged five days previously. And the wings were still in almost perfect condition so the butterfly was doing very well until it got caught by a praying mantis. But I have had a praying mantis help me before. I have rescued a monarch from prey and mantis before and then tagged it and released it. And from a spider. So spiders will catch and eat them. In fact, I saw a golden silk spider, a big spider that people call banana spiders. They're probably called golden silk spiders. And I saw a monarch in a web of a golden silk spider. 
a week or two ago, but it was already dead and, and it fell out of the web when I got my camera out to try to take a photograph of it. But I've rescued a monarch from a, from a spider web before and then tagged it and released it. So invertebrates will eat them, no problem. Spiders, praying mantises, assassin bugs, things like that. But vertebrates will not. The other enemy of monarchs, the ones that winter here or in Mexico, is crazy winter storm events. Like what we had back in 2018, we remember in January we had that weird freezing rain event? Well, if, imagine if you're an insect and you get encased in ice, or even a human. It would not very good, be good for your health. So, one of my volunteers helping me at Edisto Beach came across this bunch of dead monarchs laying in the snow. So they got freezing rain, and then as you know, 24 hours after the freezing rain, when it was still freezing temperatures, we got snow, a couple inches of snow. So they were killed by the freezing rain, and then they got snowed upon. But she said there were about 200 dead monarch butterflies. So they, monarchs roost communally, so they roost in groups. So a lot of times you'll see clusters of monarchs, particularly in the fall, but also in the winter. So this shows... Uh, from my research, the distribution of monarchs during the wintertime, this is 1996 through 2014. And then that's when I got a grant from the federal government to do more studying of monarchs. And we got volunteers up and down the South Carolina coast to help us with tagging monarchs from, from basically the middle of November through the middle of April. The first two weeks of April is kind of a um, time when the monarchs disperse, the wintering monarchs disperse during those first two weeks of April and after that they get into breeding mode. And then from 1st of December, from the, 15th, from the 16th of November through the end of March, they're in wintering mode. So I had people all up down the coast of South Carolina, volunteers help me out. So now this is the known distribution of monarchs wintering along the South Carolina coast. So we gained a lot of information, had almost 7,000 monarchs, individuals recorded or tagged. Some of them were actually recaptures of ones that were tagged elsewhere. So some of the interesting recoveries, this is one I told you I recovered one 17 times. This one I caught eight times after I tagged it at the same site where I tagged it. So it's pretty good fidelity. And the last time I caught it was 71 days after I tagged it and there had been 10 consecutive freezing nights right before I found it still alive. This, is, this one was the longest duration, 117 days from the time I tagged it until I caught it last. And you see it didn't move all that far, it stayed it was still on Folly Beach the entire time, Folly Island. But I do have them that move short distances, but stay along the coast during the winter time. This one I tagged in, in uh, October and it moved up to Patriots Point from Folly Beach, which is not that far, but there's very good habitat. What the monarchs are looking for is refrigerator-like temperatures so they can become dormant but not be frozen to death. And while they're inactive, they can't go out and drink nectar or get fluids to get water, so they'll desiccate if they were in a dry environment. So they need humidity and mean nighttime temperatures around 40 degrees, mean daytime highs in the low to mid 50s, so they can remain inactive but have moisture so they don't desiccate. They actually, in the fall, late summer in September when the monarchs get prepared to migrate, they change carbohydrates from flower nectar into lipids or fat. So I do the same thing. I've now become like a monarch. <laughs> but that protects them from the cold, that fat layer, and it also gives them an energy reserve if they have to go for a long time without being able to get out and find some kind of flower nectar. So you can see that one moved a pretty good distance. And then this one was one of my volunteers found this one at Botany Bay Plantation. I tagged it at uh, Patriots Point. But it was still along the coast. That's the one I was talking about. I recovered it 16 times after I tagged it, so I called it that called that individual butterfly 17 times. And I can tell you, they don't like to be caught. 
even though I put them in my mouth and you know, I think they made that special treatment, maybe they like that, but they don't seem to like me. <laughs> and a lot of you in here would agree with this assessment. The females seem to be brighter than the males. <laughs> male monarchs, well, male monarchs are like, I tell people they're like college freshman males. They have one thing on their mind and it's not chemistry, it's girls. And male monarchs are singularly focused. They are constantly on the outlook for girls. They chase girls until they catch them. In fact, monarch butterflies exhibit rape more so than any other kind of animal I've ever heard of. They chase the females who don't want their attention. They chase them down, they dive bomb them from above and drive them to the ground. And then once they become bonded to them, the females are fine with it. And the males fly off and the females just hang there. They don't even flap once they're, once they're a, cup, a pair. But the males will chase other males to get them out of their territory. They patrol areas looking for girls, usually where to some kind of a nectar plant or, or larval host plant. Um, so, this is a plant that occurs in brackish sandy soil. It's a, not a true milkweed, but it's a close relative of milkweeds. It's called Gulf Coast Swallowwort, and the botanical name has changed about a dozen times in the last decade. And that happens with a lot of plants, and I think it's because there are not that many new species of plants being found. So if you're a plant taxonomist, you wouldn't be able to keep your job if you didn't change names of things that already exist. <laughs> so it's kind of frustrating to people like myself because you got to be on the cutting edge to keep up with all the changes in the, uh, the and the scientific names of these of plants. Anyway, it's a relative of milkweed. It grows in brackish sandy soil, so it's, I found it on a lot of the hammock islands at Kiowa area. So I know what occurs around Kiowa, and it's only used as a larval host plant by monarchs in the spring. And that's true of almost all of our native milkweeds. The milkweeds, including this plant, which is in the same family as milkweed, but it's not in the same genus, it's in a separate genus, but it has the milky white sap, which is an indicator of poison. So if you ever pick a piece off of a plant and it secretes milky white sap, don't eat it. Because <laughs> that is an indicator of, top of poisons. All the plants that bleed white sap are poisonous to vertebrates. And this one does. And it's apparently the chemical makeup is almost identical to that of most of our native milkweeds because monarchs love it, but they only love it in the spring, and that's true of almost all of our native milkweeds, and that's because they bloom in the spring. By late spring, they're putting all of their energy into seed production. They don't put on new growth. They don't put on new leaves, so they start going downhill, and apparently the plants no longer put out the chemical attractant that attract female monarchs to lay eggs because I've surveyed areas at Folly Beach with this plant right on into June and July, and I never see a monarch after about the end of May. And apparently what happens naturally is the monarchs that spend the winter here along our coast, they breed in the early spring using primarily this plant, then their offspring would naturally disperse farther north and or west to find milkweeds like that common milkweed where their, the, the um, parents came from up north where that common milkweed grows. So we don't have much reproduction by monarchs in coastal anywhere in the southeast except in where the non-migratory populates of the monarchs other than spring. However, I have documented breeding colonies of monarchs in several cypress swamp forests, one out uh, just west of Bees Ferry Road about a mile and a half, um, and one, several places up in the France Mary National Forest and in Four Holes Swamp way up in Orangeburg County. There's a not so well-known species of native milkweed called, called um, um, aquatic milkweed that grows only in cypress swamps. And most of the milkweeds, the seeds are dispersed by wind. This one, the seeds don't have the fluffy white stuff on it. I can't remember the proper name for that, but they just fall below the plant and they're dispersed by water. So it doesn't spread to, to other wetlands very well but once it gets in a wetland, it can become very abundant and monarch butterflies love it. And the main reason is because this plant, unlike our other native milkweeds, continues to put on new growth and new flowers from basically year round. 
unless we have a, a hard freeze. Then it'll stop flowering and stop putting out new growth. But otherwise, it grows continuously and is apparently putting out the chemical signal that attracts the female monarchs. Because I found 26 monarch caterpillars yesterday on this plant. And in theory, they should be finishing up their breeding by now. So that's the reason that, that tropical milkweed, I don't know if any of you have it in your yard or not, but I tell people it's kind of a double-edged sword and I don't know whether it's, I don't know whether total is good or bad. But what has happened is we have, we have produced man-made breeding populations of monarchs. Because like I said before, the, the barrier islands don't have native milkweeds. And if they did, the monarchs don't use them except in the spring. So having these summertime and basically year-round colonies of monarchs is very unusual and, and against the natural order of things. But it may be good. It's a species that's in trouble. Maybe it's creating new populations that will help in the long run. I don't know. But tropical milkweed is a perennial, but it's a tropical perennial which means it, its behavior is very different than our native perennials. Our native perennials defoliate in about the end of October, going into early November. And like I said, they don't put out new growth after they flower in the, late, in the spring and late spring. This one, like the swamp milkweed, puts out new growth continuously because we don't have a dry season. So it, will, it can be killed in the winter by frost or hard freezes because it's a tropical plant. But other than that, it just keeps growing. So it attracts female monarchs to lay eggs even in the winter. And that's not good because a lot of those eggs are lost because if you get a freeze following it, it'll kill the plant and or the larvae. And you also get adult monarchs produced, fresh adult monarchs produced in the wintertime. And they're not, they don't have the fat layers to protect them from the cold. So if we get a freeze, those winter produced adult monarchs will die. So the other neat thing about that plant is, is it's the larval host plant for the queen butterfly, which is a non-migratory relative of the monarch. It's more of a kind of a tropical, subtropical insect that with climate change, we've got a lot more queen butterflies in coastal South Carolina than we did 25, 30 years ago. But it's larva, that's the larva of the queen. It feeds almost exclusively on Gulf Coast swallowwort, and that's the flowers. So that's the sites at Folly Beach. It grows in what I call uh, estuarine meadows. It's areas just higher than the salt marsh, but grassland type areas out in the salt marsh where it gets some influence of salt. The sand, as we know on the Barry Islands, is quite sandy, the, the soil. So it's very uh, sandy, kind of brackish soil with a lot of sunlight is where that plant typically grows. It's, it's distributed along the entire Atlantic coast from North Carolina down even into the Gulf. And I've been told that monarchs in Florida, some of the monarchs in Florida use it as a laurel host plant as well. So that just shows you I raised monarchs from, from, from eggs found on that plant all the way to the adulthood and tagged them. So there's no doubt that they use it as a caterpillar plant. So I'm not going to go into a lot of that. But. So that's the spring dispersal. I don't have a whole lot of data on that, but presumably they go somewhere when they leave the back of the coast. So I caught one that dispersed from Folly up to Patriots Point just a few days, a day or so after I tagged it. This is one of the sites I'm talking about. It's, it's now owned by Charleston County Park. It's uh, called Bulow County Park. It's, it used to be a hunt club. In fact, there's a development next door to it called the Hunt Club. Um, there's also a swamp in the area that's not within the county park. It's called Bear Swamp. If you've been down Bees Ferry Road to where it hits US Highway 17 South, right before you get to that intersection, there's a road off to the right that's called Bear Swamp Road. And there's a swamp called Bear Swamp. It's a cypress swamp, and it winds down kind of in a serpentine fashion and crosses Bear Swamp Road twice. But it has a lot of that milkweed, as does a, another wetland in the Bulow County Park property, and it's got their breeding monarch population. Lots and lots of monarchs. 
So these are the primary native milkweeds to the coastal plain of South Carolina. I've been surveying the Francis Marion National Forest looking for milkweeds, so I've documented all these sites. And the numbers now for aquatic milkweed is probably more like 5,000 in site records, and that's, a, that's uh, at least 10 meters from another individual that I recorded. So there's probably, in some of these places, there's thousands of stems of that milkweed per acre. Just very dense colonies of that plant that, like I said, are very attractive to monarchs. I have found them using almost all of these other milkweeds on occasion, but they don't use them, like I said, only in the spring. I don't find any evidence of them on them, and the, pl the plants pretty much disappear by summer. So this is a look at some of the coastal milkweeds. By the way, they like all of the milkweeds are excellent nectar plants. So any kind of pollinator really loves milkweed flowers, including monarch butterflies. So I catch a lot of monarch butterflies on the flowers. That's the aquatic milkweed I was telling you about. And butterfly milkweed is not a primary larval host plant for monarch larvae because butterfly weed milkweed is very hairy. It's called tomentos. The leaves and the stems are just covered with dense hairs, and that is the way the plant attempts to prevent anything from eating it. So it's not very palatable. So monarch butterflies don't usually lay eggs on that plant because the caterpillars don't like dealing with all the hairs. So it's not a, not a, a preferred uh, caterpillar plant. So that's a ball cypress wetland, and that's, you can see almost all these plants in here are that aquatic milkweed. So that's the habitat in which it grows. So I, I was uh, asked to accompany a lady with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service to walk them on National Wildlife Refuge because the manager, manager of the refuge said he had seen that milkweed on the refuge. So they asked me if I'd come up and go around with them one day and see if we could see any evidence of monarch butterflies. Well, we went around for a day and we found monarch caterpillars, which suggests to me there are monarchs there. So now I have documented monarch breeding as far north in South Carolina as Waccamaw National Ref not Wildlife Refuge and as far west as Orangeburg County. So, and several swamps in Francis Marion National Forest. In fact, one of the swamps is probably something like 100,000 acres of monarch habitat. So this is the Wamba Swamp area that I just mentioned. So that swamp, I don't know if you've been up in the France Man National Forest, but there, there are forest service roads that go down either side of that swamp. But there's hardly any access to the swamp itself. And that's because they primarily do logging, which is primarily blah 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 pine. So they, fortunately they don't go down to the swamps and cut the cypress trees. But it's difficult to access the swamp. So everywhere I've accessed the swamp, I've recorded that milkweed. So because it disperses by water, it's almost certainly throughout that swamp system from the headwaters where I first found it all the way to the Santee River. And every spot that I have searched, I've found the milkweed. And almost all of those sites I've found monarchs. So I think there's one gigantic monarch population and breeding area in that swamp. And it has several tributaries that have milkweed in it as well. Mill Branch, Meshaw Creek. And the Coffee Creek is on the headwaters of, of the Wamba system and the milkweed occurs there. In fact, I was just there yesterday and that's where I told you I found 19 caterpillars. So this is some of the other breeding sites I've found. Again, this is springtime breeding on butterfly weed milkweed and class bean milkweed and Pinewoods milkweed. So they use some of these other milkweeds, but just occasionally in the spring. These are other sites where I've found the uh, aquatic milkweed. And I've seen a few monarchs at these sites, so I, I don't have time to, to go everywhere. Um, I wish I could, but I just can't. I'm, I work seven days a week, pretty much, because I'm so obsessed with this. But it takes that to try to keep up with it. Because for instance, if you only visit a site once every two weeks, 
your data are not very good because a lot can happen in the life of butterflies in two weeks. In fact, during the, during the growing season, spring through fall, most butterflies only live for like three to five weeks. So this is that Bulow County Park area I was telling you about and I've documented the milkweed all the way from it. Basically it's a creek that flows one direction, starts in the middle right here at this housing development and this part flows to the west and this part flows to the southeast. So it's connected to Rantowles Creek on the west, northwest end of the wetland and it's connected to the Stone Oak River on the southeast portion of the wetland. But the milkweed is too out of it, as are monarch butterflies. So I'll be going there tomorrow. I'll be walking in the swamp for about eight or nine hours straight tomorrow. Now I found this milkweed is used a lot by monarchs in the France Man National Forest where it occurs, but again only in the spring. Longleaf milkweed, and unfortunately it's another special, the milkweeds are very specialized. So it's difficult to find a native milkweed that is suitable for most human-owned habitats. This one grows in like um, clay soil in damp soil, clay-based soil, but only in the warm part of the state. So it's only in the coastal plain, but it's very specific where you find it. So if you plant it in a garden, it wouldn't survive. Um, and I was talking with some people earlier today, one of the problems with planting native plants is I cringe when people tell me they planted a native plant because it's probably not native. Because it can be the native species but plants have evolved into what are called ecotypes. So in a given ecoregion, like the lower coastal plain of South Carolina is the ecoregion, which has its own unique climate, climatology and soil types and so forth. So the species in that region has evolved over thousands of years to, the, to be the best genetic fit for that area. So if you bring the same species in from another ecoregion, particularly if it's from a long distance like maybe Pennsylvania or Florida or Texas. A lot of species are distributed over an entire eastern half of the United States, but they're very different from one region to another. So if you bring that specimens of that species in from somewhere else, it basically hybridizes with the native ecotype and then the offspring, the fitness of the offspring is diminished relative to the, its suitability to the ecosystem in which it should, it, you're putting it. So I've caught so many monarchs that I've seen some really unusual things. This is probably the most unusual because I had really never even heard of a bilateral hermaphrodite. <laughs> that's something that's, that's half male and half female. And this monarch, you can, male monarchs have this black spot right down the hind wing. See it on that one? That is a gland that in other species in that family of butterflies, it's a uh, it produces pheromones or cologne that make the females like the males. So for instance, the queen butterfly, that gland works and the female monarchs like the males. In monarchs, it, a gland does not function. So instead, the males are hyper aggressive and chase the girls. But this one is, the right half of this butterfly is male, the left half is female. So the females don't have the black spot and their wings are a little bit duller orange. So you can see it very clearly. I mean, there's no doubt whatsoever that half of that butterfly is male and half is female. I don't know what its functionality was. Uh, and then this one is what the so-called white monarch, which they're supposedly pretty common in Hawaii because monarchs were introduced to Hawaii and apparently somebody introduced some of these white ones. But they're genetically different from the other monarchs and according to the University of Kansas, is like a one in 100,000 chance of seeing one of these in the eastern, anywhere in the continent of North America. So I photographed this one at Folly Beach. So I'm one of the fortunate few that's seen a white monarch. And then occasionally I see these apparently hybrids that are part white monarch and part regular monarch. And they have these light colored streaks in their wings, which is pretty cool. <coughs> So that's it, but uh, the monarchs, like I said, they roost communally. So when there's lots of monarchs around, if you're fortunate, you can happen upon them, aggregations of monarchs, and that's really great for someone like me that tags them and tries to tag as many as I can. 
The reason I have this trying to tag as many as I can add to you is because the more tags you put out, the better the chances are you're going to get some usable information back. If you only tag a dozen monarchs, there are hundreds of thousands of them, so the odds of getting a recovery are practically zero. So the more you tag, the more opportunity you have to gain information. So I want to tag every monarch that I see. And I go overboard with it because I get quite upset with myself if I see a monarch and don't catch it. And many of them do not ever afford me the opportunity to catch them. But I was talking before about the females. When I go into like the swamp tomorrow, there's a good chance I'll have a couple of monarchs that like bolt when they see me. <laughs> and I wear camo, I wear full camo, and people ask me, oh, he always said, did you have a nice day hunting? And I say, yeah, but I wouldn't hunt anything you would ever hunt. Yeah. They figure I'm going deer hunting or something because I'm wearing camouflage. I wear full camo, camo hat. I should take my, paint my face, but I don't. Um, <laughs> you might scare people. But obviously I need to wear a hat, so the reflection doesn't frighten them. But the female monarchs that I have tagged do not let me catch them back. They'll see me coming from like 100 yards away and they take off and fly up into the canopy and will land up in the canopy waiting on me to leave before they come back down. The ones I have not tagged, I can oftentimes catch, male or female. But the males are difficult to catch because they almost always are in flight because they're constantly flying around in what I call patrolling mode, looking for girls. So they don't land. They don't, I mean, they chase other boys or try to find a girl before they leave but at night they're easy to catch because they get in these groups like this um, and I didn't have a slide of it but you guys if you know if you're familiar with a plant called ground cell tree it's a native shrub it's a perennial shrub it, it defoliates during the winter time but it grows along the edges of the marsh it gets to be a pretty good sized shrub and has whitish cream colored flowers on it in, the, in October, in the early November, right at the time of the mass migration of monarchs. So monarch migration, I think, has evolved to come through the southeastern coastal area at the exact time of the bloom of that plant. Because it is one of the most uh, desired nectar plants for all pollinators. Um, the male plant. It's one of those weird plants where there are male plants and female plants. No plant have both male and female parts. So the male flowers produce the, um, what's it called? Pollen. The plants pollinate what? Pollen. Pollen. <laughs> the male plants produce the pollen. So the male, the, when the butterflies and other insects, if you look at one of these plants when they're blooming, which people cut them down because they don't like them to, to obscure their view of the marsh. Oh. But it's a fantastic plant for all the pollinator insects, including monarchs, and also for animals that eat pollinated insects like flies and so forth. So the birds that migrate through in the fall that eat flies and so forth love that plant as well. Um, but it's called ground cell tree. And monarchs cluster on it in so many, so many, so many numbers that I've caught as many as 60 monarchs in one swing of my net. So there'll be 150 or 200 monarchs on one plant, oftentimes. So it's quite a spectacle. I'm not that's how. The middle word. What's the middle word? Ground what tree? Ground cell. G R G R O U N D S E L. One word. Gotcha. Tree. And the, the genus is Bacchus. B A C C H A R I S. Halimifolia. H A L I M I F O L I A. Bacchus halimifolia. It's a. Uh, it's a. It once was a common shrub along the coast and it grows primarily along the coast and it's distributed from New England all the way down into Florida and its bloom coincides with the movement of monarchs throughout its range. So the other thing they use quite a bit starting in late September about now and into early October is seaside, go seaside goldenrod and it's starting to bloom right now. That's the goldenrod that grows right along the edge of the marsh. Yeah. So you can see I'm holding a monarch in my mouth. So Tell us again why you do that. Because, like I told you, I've caught as many as 60 monarchs in one swing of my net. Well, I want to get them out of my net as quickly as I can because they can damage themselves flapping around, okay. hitting each other and so forth in the net. So I only have two hands. I didn't bring one of them, but yeah, I did. When I catch them, 
I put them in these wax paper envelopes because it protects their wings and it calms them down because I catch them, I stick them in them, I have a vest and I stick them in the pocket of my vest and zip the pocket shut so they're in the dark and they calm down. And then when I get back to my car, if I'm not tagging them or releasing them right there, I'll put them in an ice chest, which is also dark. Not directly in contact with the ice, but just to lower their body temperature, cool them down, they go pretty much semi-dormant. But the quicker I can get them in these envelopes, the better off they are. But I only have two hands. And I can't use my feet very well. <laughs> so out of frustration one day, I had like, like I said, 20 or 60 or so monarchs in my net flopping all around, possibly damaging each other. So I reached in and grabbed as many, grabbed them and stuck them in envelopes. I'll put as many as three in one of these envelopes. And then there were still monarchs in my net. So out of frustration, I stuck them in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll show you a little bit in a little bit when I tag these. When monarchs are really unusual relative to the other butterflies, they play possum. When they feel like they can't get away, they'll play dead. So when I stuck it in my mouth, I just put it between my lips. I didn't put it between my teeth. I didn't try to bite them up because again, I know they're poisonous, the vertebrates. So I don't want to get poisoned by one. So I just held it between my lips and it played dead. It didn't stick its legs out and grab my tongue or anything. So I was like, hey, pretty cool. So I stuck another one there, so same thing. So I've had like as many as a dozen monarchs in my mouth because it's better for the monarchs because they don't damage them, each other. But that's how I evolved that behavior. And people think it's pretty weird, but it's... I'm serious, try it. They don't bother me at all. It's kind of like the carpenter bee thing. Which again, I won't do that either. What, what sets monarchs apart, other than their coloration and, and uh, beauty, what sets them apart from other butterflies we see commonly on the Well, the one is they're migratory. So other butterflies that we see around Kiowa are necessarily... Not highly migratory like monarchs. There's different types of migration. There's true migration, which is moving from cold to a warmer climate to right. survive in order not to get frozen to death, which is what most migrations are. Then there are migrations that are called e-migration. And e-migration is simply a movement out of the normal home range. And we have a lot of our butterflies that exhibit e-migrations. And one is that Gulf fritillary butterfly, the one that's so abundant now that's smaller than a monarch. People, if you're a birder at all, I tell people that you can tell between a monarch and a viceroy butterfly that supposedly mimic monarchs very readily if you're a birder because Monarchs fly like a turkey vulture. Viceroy butterflies fly like a black vulture. Gulf fritillaries fly very frenetically. They're very shallow, rapid wing beats. They're not graceful at all. Monarchs are incredibly graceful, like a turkey vulture. They, they don't flap their wings unless they absolutely have to. They mostly soar and glide. Um, and they're larger than uh, Gulf fritillaries only three quarters the size of a monarch. So a monarch is a larger butterfly. And Gulf fritillaries are, like right now, there are a thousand Gulf fritillaries to every monarch. And that's because they're a native southeastern species and the population of most insects increases throughout the year until you get to fall. And then they exhibit e-migration behavior. Because the populations get so gigantic, the loss of hundreds of individuals or thousands of individuals is meaningless to the long-term survival of the species. So those species have a very major advantage with climate change because e-migrations are mass movements in various directions with the, end, with the idea of possibly finding new breeding habitat. So if, you don't, if a species is sedentary and doesn't go anywhere ever, they're gonna be very vulnerable to climate change implications, whereas species that radiate out might colonize new areas that become suitable. So I've seen that, I used to do research when I first started working with DNR, I was a fisheries biologist and I helped work on a snapper grouper profit, progress profit uh, project. So we were offshore. So I would see Gulf fritillaries flying aimlessly still to the east, 60 or 80 miles offshore, still flying to the east. And that's why this time of year when you're walking on the beaches, which I avoid the beaches because humans don't want me around. <laughs> You see the carcasses of Gulf fritillaries washed up on the beach because they keep flying and flying and flying until they run out of energy, they fall to the water surface, they die and they float, so they wash back onto the beaches. But monarchs are much smarter. 
I had some people up in uh, Virginia or somewhere talking about how they seen monarchs flying offshore, and that's why they claim that monarchs will fly from Florida to Mexico. And I say, no, 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 no. Monarchs won't fly across water, large bodies of water. They're too smart to do that. I've never seen a monarch with outside of maybe 100 yards of the beach. In fact, they generally fly in, inland of the dunes. They hardly ever fly out over the beach itself, whereas Gulf Riddle areas do. Do they have a coating on them, like a moth? Yes. The wings of butterflies and moths, all butterflies and moths are covered by scales, which are microscopic in size, size and are arranged like shingles on a roof. And that gives them the, the structural integrity and without a whole lot of extra weight. And it also gives them all the coloration they have, the camouflage and so forth, all the colors are from the scales and the arrangement thereof. So each scale is of an individual color. So it's quite incredible to think about the designs. But this, you see the underside of these monarchs, the underside of a Gulf Fritillary has bright metallic silver splotches on it. So they don't look anything alike if you have them in hand. And I should have brought one up here, but I didn't. I thought I had a slide that showed it, but I just apparently didn't show it. I didn't show a slide with a Gulf Riddler, did I? No. I must have taken that out of here, which I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. but, um, all over here right now. So knowing that, um, that monarchs are uh, suffering because they're a migratory species, what can we do on Kiowa to help the monarch? What, what can we plant? What can we promote growing? Well, protect ground cell tree, male ground cell trees particularly if you can because they are no doubt essential for migratory monarch butterflies. The other thing is for the wintering monarchs, plant viburnum suspensum. Plant loquat. Um, loquat does pretty well on the baryons. It is susceptible to a fungus disease that will just outright kill it. But I know people, I gave a loquat tree to a lady on Folly Beach 25 years ago. She still has it in her yard and it's like 25 feet tall now. And I probably catch 500 monarchs off of her loquat tree every, every winter. So, uh, and you get, the, you get the, also the benefit of having things like Baltimore Orioles and the wintering hummingbirds, things like that will come to the flowers as well. So it's a really neat plant. And then that viburnum suspensum blooms in February. It's very fragrant. People tell me I, I lost my sense of smell years and years ago. It wasn't from COVID, which I have not had. <laughs> but uh, it attracts all the pollinators in February, which is not many things that bloom in February. So, so I notice you're not saying plant milkweeds. Well, that's because I told you, I was, I've done coastal ecology work and never seen a native milkweed on any of the barrier islands or even the, the Grand Strand area, seaward of Highway 17. Basically, Highway 17 is the demarcation line for where you will and will not find native milkweeds. Inland of Highway 17, we have lots of native milkweeds. Seaward of it, they apparently are just not at all salt tolerant. And like I said, even if you get native milkweeds, they bloom in the spring, the monarchs will use them in the spring and then they don't pay any attention to them after that. Except for this one species and DNR, we, in our education program there's a girl with DNR and she's working with Roots and Shoots Nursery trying to propagate this swamp, milk, this aquatic milkweed that I mentioned. And seeing it, I've heard that it'll grow in upland sites if you treat it appropriately. But it naturally grows in cypress swamps. So it probably needs acidic soil with a high organic load. Um, and a more moisture than, than most people would be willing probably to provide for it to, to do its best. But I've got a friend at Folly Beach that I gave a couple of plants of that species to. He planted it in a raised bed. And he, his house is on the marsh and it's still living. And he's had monarch eggs and caterpillars on it this summer. But that's because the reason they're there, the monarchs are there because of all the tropical milkweed. Before so people started planting. Well, that's probably the best bet, and DNR is going to start trying to propagate it in, uh, like I said, in a partnership with Roots and Shoot Nursery. And uh, the same girl with DNR, her name is Olivia Bueno. She's also propagated the uh, Gulf Coast Swallowwort, and she's taken some of her uh, the, the plants she produced. She's taken them up to Huntington Beach State Park. They want to plant some there, um, although it's probably already there. But. Uh, Anyway, I've got uh, five monarchs we can tag if you guys 
Yeah. I want to gather around and see how I go about doing that. Yeah. Do you want to do that in here or well, outside? Well, I can. Is there? Is yes, there? Sir, a, this is where all you can open up onto this. We can just deck. walk out there and let them go. Okay. So whatever works for you and the Oh, I brought the monitor.